Hello everyone joining us online and here in the room for today's event on learning from the sun to decarbonize Europe's power with fusion energy. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels coming at you live from the heart of the EU quarter where we are going to be talking about fusion, which actually is a technology that's not particularly well known to the general public. And yet, it's a process that's happening all around us and on which our very survival depends. That's because fusion is the process that powers the sun and other stars, which gives us all life on Earth. The question that's been deemed the holy grail of energy production is whether that process can be harnessed by humans to produce energy. It could be a game changer for the future of zero carbon energy because it doesn't emit greenhouse gases and it's virtually inexhaustible. Now, fusion science and technology has a long history in Europe. ITER, a collaborative project uh, for research between 35 countries, 
is one of the most ambitious energy projects in the world, designed to prove the feasibility of fusion as a large-scale and carbon-free source of energy. The urgency of fighting climate change is giving renewed momentum to these efforts and attracting private capital into different fusion projects with the objective of making fusion providing energy to the grid a business reality. Support through investment in public and private partnerships in order to speed up research could lead to industrial scale development of fusion technology. But where does the EU stand when it comes to technological development? What's needed for progress in this field? And is the regulatory framework fostering innovation here in Europe? That's what we're going to be discussing today with a distinguished group of expert panelists who I will introduce to you now. So here in the room, we have Massimo Gariba, Deputy Director General responsible for the coordination of Euratom policies at the European Commission's Energy Department. And we have Francesca Ferrazza, who is Head of Magnetic Fusion Initiatives at the Italian energy company Eni. Then joining us online, we have Czech MEP Andre Notek from the Renew Europe Group, who is a substitute member of the Environment Committee in the European Parliament. We have Susanna Clement Lorenzo, Head of Broader Approach Program and Delivery at Fusion for Energy. And we have Jennifer Ganton, Chief Movement Builder at the Commonwealth Fusion System. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Now, you guys at home will be able to ask your questions to the panelists as well using Slido. So to do that, you're going to want to scan the QR code that's just appeared on your screen that will take you to the Slido page where you can type in your questions and I will read out your questions uh, to the panelists at the end of the panel. It would be great if you can say who you are, where you're from, and which panelists you're directing the question to, although you're welcome to ask your question anonymously as well, if you like. For those of you here in the room, you'll also be asking your questions on Slido. You can scan the QR code on the screen that you see there, or uh, if that's not working, you can find the QR code on the walls around you and a couple of the posters there. So, Massimo, let's start with a question for you. So as I mentioned, the, the framework for Europe is a really critical question here because Europe does have quite a past uh, for supporting fusion technology. What is the role of the European Commission in these ongoing fusion efforts? Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, let's say that uh, uh, you know that in the Commission we follow a net zero policy. And so each and every energy source that can contribute to that uh, is, of course, uh, um, let me say, most welcome. And fusion, uh, because of all the things that you said in the introduction, is clearly a candidate in the medium term to fit this role. So. Uh, fusion is, is carbon free, it is uh, supposed to be safe and uh, has the potential to, uh, to be uh, rather limitless in, in, in the way that it is can be exploited. Now, traditionally, the EU and its member states had followed one of the two main paths to fusion which is uh, um, the what is called the magnetic confinement. So you, you keep particles uh, in, in a hot chamber with, uh, um, with very strong magnetic fields uh, all together. So we have, uh, let me say, since decades from the Commission been uh, financing these, uh, these developments uh, first with an optic of research and development, but then with an optic of innovation and industrialization, because uh, as I said at the beginning, the, uh, the goal is to actually have an energy source. So where are we now? We are with ITER. Uh, you said 35 countries. I would like to say seven international partners, one of which is the EU. Uh, ITER is uh, uh, being built and is designed to demonstrate the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion. What does it mean? Scientific means that you can actually do it according to the laws of physics, and technological means that you have all the materials and the technologies that are there to actually make it happen. Um, 
is this enough? No, because then you have uh, then you have to demonstrate that, as I said, out of this energy source you can uh, you can take out energy, and therefore you need what is called a demonstration reactor, which will come post ITER in the future, and this is where uh, substantial research and development work is going on with the Euratom framework program. Now, before you get there. I think that is also very important to understand that with a single machine, which is ITER, you cannot make it all happen. You need an environment, uh, you need an ecosystem of machines that uh, can, actually, can actually make this happen. And in the EU, we have a privileged partnership with Japan, and this is where Susanna is, is sitting at the moment with, with Fusion for Energy, where we are working on two main things. One is a machine similar to ITER, uh, but is devoted to do a little bit more physics type experiment than, than ITER, which is also, as I said, geared towards technology. And uh, we have also, uh, and we have the last launched last week in, in, in Granada, a partnership between uh, Spain and, and Croatia, uh, where a machine to demonstrate and to test the feasibility of materials which are needed for keeping this very hot plasma uh, uh, confined, uh, which is called DONES, uh, will, will, will be built. And last uh, but not least, I would like to mention the, the private sector effort. Uh, this is a rather new phenomenon which has been springing up mainly in the US, but also now it is, it is moving, moving to Europe. And I think that what will be key is two things. First of all is to understand uh, what can be the actual contribution of the private investment into that. I think that uh, potentially the private investment can give uh, a huge push to the, to the, to the research effort. We have to be very careful in over-promising over and under-delivering, like, uh, like in other fields, but if there is enough of an ecosystem, we can probably create an environment where disruptive technologies can, uh, can emerge. And the second issue is how do we connect the private sector effort to the public sector initiatives, like ITER, that are ongoing at the moment in terms of, for example, training of staff and competition for staff, maybe, yeah? uh, because you don't find fusion engineers or scientists, you know, everywhere in the corner of the street. I think I'll leave it at that, and then we can go on. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, your point about you have all these single machine projects, but in order to make this feasible, we need an ecosystem uh, for fusion. That's what we'll be talking about a little more in a bit. Um, let's turn to Andre Notek next, uh, joining us remotely. Um, so talking a little bit about what the EU is doing in this area that we just heard from Massimo, what do you think should be the EU's priorities for trying to get fusion off the ground here and really make it, as Massimo was saying, feasible and viable? So firstly, very good afternoon. Uh, many thanks for the invitation. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. Uh, so uh, what I'm uh, somehow missing is uh, using of uh, this uh, enormous momentum, this potential you have, Dave, uh, basically mentioned. Uh, now, uh, after the COVID crisis and now the uh, energy crisis, if I may say it like this, uh, we are desperately looking for all ways how to decarbonize and as well, uh, how to provide in the future and uh, also now, uh, but as well in the future, um, the affordable energy and also energy that can be produced um, basically locally. We are calling for strategic autonomy. And uh, indeed, um, now the full priority is going for the renewables, which I do understand in the short term. But if we look into the longer perspective, then um, simply uh, we need to have additional sources of energy. And uh, those that are currently in development, like fusion, need our full recognition. And this is what, unfortunately, we do not see today. Uh, as Mr. Gariba uh, explained, um, EU has a positive approach uh, towards fusion, and I'm very grateful for this. But we are now in an enormous momentum. And um, to be very honest, uh, I have uh, this feeling that uh, 
uh, also United States and, uh, and Great Britain are simply uh, quite ahead uh, uh, of uh, this situation and uh, we need to catch up. And it is a great occasion for our businesses, uh, uh, purely EU or trans transatlantic, EU transatlantic uh, cooperation. And uh, uh, after the recognition, we need to really uh, find a way how to stimulate uh, private investments uh, coming also from EU into this sector. Uh, it is uh, quite important, not only for reaching our climate goals uh, in 2050, but also to maintain uh, our uh, climate uh, uh, standards post or after 2050. Thanks a lot, Andre. So as we know, this is a very technical uh, subject, but luckily we have Jennifer Ganton here with us to walk us through the, the technical aspects. Um, Jennifer, can you just explain to us how does fusion work and, and what makes it different from fission, which is what, uh, what we've really been using up to this point? Hi. So I'm going to explain it in terms that are pretty simple um, to grasp, and that is uh, really fusion is the opposite of fission, if you think about it. Uh, they happen uh, on the opposite ends of the periodic table, and instead of splitting uh, the, ad uh, the atom, the fusion is uh, fusing together two hydrogen nuclei. Uh, and that becomes helium. It releases helium, but it also re releases an en enormous amount of energy when it does that. So what commercial fusion systems are trying to do is harness that process in a smaller type scale. And, uh, and that will create a heat source that then can then be converted into electricity. Um, so from that perspective, it's a reaction that is controllable. It can be turned on and off. Um, and so it makes an ideal dispatchable power source um, and it can serve as a baseload source of power. So it has the benefits of renewables of no carbon emissions um, because the byproduct is the helium. And, uh, and then it can also uh, serve as baseload power, similar to what we have from fossil fuels today. Um, but you can put it in any location. So um, the, one of the benefits of that is as well, it can also plug into the existing grid. Uh, so some of the things that commercial fusion is thinking about is putting these devices in areas where you can uh, have interconnects that maybe are repowering what used to be a retired coal site. So it uses small amounts of fuel, uh, these hydrogen isotopes, um, but probably the attributes that I think are most interesting to people when you think about a fusion reaction and what happens is it uses the uh, hydrogen isotopes as its fuel, so it doesn't have any special nuclear material like uranium or plutonium. Um, it also doesn't uh, create a chain reaction. Um, it's actually, uh, you need the exact conditions to create the fusion, um, reaction. And so should there be uh, a breach of the vessel or something happens, the slightest bit of air will stop the fusion reaction immediately. Um, so we don't have those concerns about a chain reaction with the fusion, uh, with the fusion devices. And, um, and also uh, it doesn't produce sort of long lived high level waste. Um, and so I think there's a lot of things here that we think about with policy and regulation and how fusion is very different than fission. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that or also what we're doing here at Commonwealth Fusion as the, as the conversation goes on because we are building a fusion device as we speak to try to demonstrate this reaction here. Thanks. So Susanna, we've heard about the different projects happening all over the world, North America, Japan. Tell me why is fusion particularly interesting here in Europe? Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. Okay. Yes. Then, um, why is it uh, interesting for Europe in particular? So, uh, well, uh, Europe first is energy dependent, and uh, fusion would provide the base load electricity, which is a big asset. In 2020, the EU imported more than half of the energy it consumed, and that daily meant about a billion euro per day. So in, in 2050, it's estimated that the demand will be three times higher, so fusion certainly will help to achieve self-sufficiency. 
Then there are the geopolitical concerns. So the current crisis with Russia has shown how exposed we were to uh, addiction to Russian gas. And uh, now it is uh, percolated to the public. 84% of the Europeans are asking us to reduce our dependency on Russian gas. Then the European population is also highly concerned about climate change. So 93% of the Europeans consider that climate change is a serious problem. And the 90% are asking us to reduce CO2 emissions to the minimum. So we know that uh, climate change is a disruptive factor in energy supply, consumption with power cuts, increased demand at times, aging infrastructure, etc. And we need definitely friendly solutions to generate energy and fusion is going to be one of them. Uh, Europe also aspires to be a leader in cutting down greenhouse gases. So there again, uh, fusion should help. And uh, according to the IEA, our CO2 emissions grew only by less than 1% in 2022. And this would have been impossible if we hadn't already started to diversify our energy mix going to decarbonize solutions. So uh, this is in general for the European population. And But all of these seem somehow future benefits. That is when fusion actually works in uh, commercial uh, reactors. But while we are doing the research, we are seeing also present day benefits for Europe. It increases the know-how, it results in new products and new markets that make Europe more competitive. And we have lots of examples from past and present fusion research, like superconducting magnets that have yielded simpler and more powerful medical resonance machines, or remote handling tools that were developed for JET, the, the predecessor in Europe of ITER, and they are used in industry, in medical surgery, uh, robots to assist uh, people with mobility issues, nuclear decommissioning, and many others. So for all these reasons, I think uh, yeah, fusion is definitely interesting for Europe now and in the future. And it will help also to train a new generation of scientists that uh, are highly uh, conversant with uh, cutting edge technologies and hopefully get to operate these devices. We have invested years in fusion, supporting R&D in this domain, and we will harvest the benefits, hopefully, in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Susanna. So, Francesca, uh, ENI has been involved in fusion for some time. Tell me, why is ENI so interested in making a bet on fusion, and what are some of the projects that you guys have been involved in? everyone and thank you for this opportunity so yes we've uh, we've started looking at fusion some a few years ago actually um, starting from the collaboration we have uh, with MIT we've had for a long time and so the the, the paper on on arc had just come out and uh, so we started talking to Dennis white and the group at PSFC and then decided to invest in in CFS um, we are a technology-based company, uh, uh, apart from being an energy company, and we, uh, we are working on a decarbonization path. So we are taking all the energy mix we can do uh, in terms of renewables, biofuels, uh, storage, you name it, CCS. And so fusion fits in that mix. In the medium-long term, uh, fusion can represent uh, all, all of the, the above you have said uh, about fusion. So it's, it's a firm kind of energy. So it will be very valuable in, a, in, a, in, in an energy, energy demanding world. So we, we believe fusion can, can, uh, can be a part of it. Uh, so we invested in CFS and we are a strategic investor. So it's not just investment, but we've also put our, um, our effort, our, our people, our engineers, we are used to big, uh, difficult projects in, in various parts of the world and so we, we started giving um, attention in that, in that, in that sense. Uh, mm, apart from CFS, we, also, um, we are also part of the TTT project with ENEA and a number of um, academic institutions in Italy. And that's part of the European roadmap uh, in order to understand how to, how to deal with the, with the very high 
um, thermal budgets. And we also have collaborations with, with academic institutes and talking to the industry. So we, are, we are actually created a, an ecosystem of starting to do so. Um, I wanted to go back to something Andre mentioned. So um, Andre said that you have the impression that the US and the UK are getting a bit of the lead here compared to Europe in terms of um, research and investment in this area of fusion. Massimo, would you agree with that characterization? And how does what's happening in Europe compare to what's happening in North America? Uh, should I give a straight answer? Yes. No, I don't agree. <laughs> uh, I, actually, I actually think that um, Europe has been um, consistently leading in, uh, in fusion research, and historically it has done so uh, with strong ties with Japan. Um, what we have seen in, uh, in the US, let me comment on that, is, uh, first of all, uh, it's a very important experiment what they have done. They have, uh, for the first time, obtained on planet Earth more energy than what was used in, 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 a, in a fusion experiment, using a technology which is completely different. Uh, there are a number of catches in that. First of all, uh, the total amount of energy was, was put in is not calculated, it's only part of the amount of what is put in, which is traditionally what is, what is needed to, uh, let me say, hit the plasma. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm not trying to detract from that, nevertheless, this is an incredibly important step. However, what we are doing in Europe is uh, orders of magnitudes bigger when we look at ITER uh, in, in so far as we are going to obtain, once ITER works, amounts of energy which are incomparably higher than what has, has been obtained in, in the US. So, for, and, and the US knows very well, and this is why they are a very important partner in ITER itself. So let me say that these are two separate things. When it comes to the UK, uh, I think that in the UK, again, there is, uh, there is lots of interest, and, uh, and we have... Uh, observed uh, very carefully also after Brexit, you know, the, the way that, uh, that uh, they are working and so on. I can only say they are very interested in rejoining ITER uh, and coming back to work with Europe because uh, I think that in this specific field we have a uh, joint interest to uh, make forces combine. Moreover, uh, in the UK, there is uh, still the biggest fusion machine operating, which is JET, the Joint European Taurus, that was built uh, by Euratom uh, in, uh, well, in the early 80s. Um, and so we have also, we have also a, an interest to reconnect and make sure that these type of facilities are, are uh, there. So far, let me also say this, so far fusion has been a collective effort. Why is it that a collection of 35 countries, as you said, and I said seven partners? Because in, in, in 85, when uh, Reagan and Gorbachev started uh, to talk about ITER, uh, the notion was that, uh, let me say, nobody had enough resources in the world to put it together. And so I think that rather, you know, a little bit of competition is healthy, and this is why I said the private sector is good. On the other hand, a good amount of cooperation is also, is also needed in order to achieve such big endeavor. You have to look at it a little bit, uh, I don't know, the uh, International Space Stations or CERN and so on, where you have really the global scientific uh, community that is collaborating. So I wouldn't put it in these competition terms. Um, Jennifer, what is your impression of the difference in terms of what's happening in North America uh, versus what's happening in Europe? And how, how has the experience with ITER informed a lot of the work that's happening around the world? No, it's a good question. And, uh, and I would have to agree with the Deputy Director General from a scientific perspective. Fusion has been um, a global cooperation. There's been advances uh, across the world, and uh, and I think the commercial sector has benefited from that greatly. Uh, so that uh, we hope to see continue. Uh, and I, I think it might be helpful, though, to talk a little bit about the, co the commercial environment, the business environment that's needed 
for fusion to really reach the scale that's needed to be meaningful to impact the net zero objectives of 2050. Um, so Commonwealth Fusion Systems, uh, I'll give a little bit of background and then I'll get to your question. We were, as, uh, as Francesca said, we were spun out of MIT in 2018 um, and we now have about 400 employees. Uh, we've been able to raise over $2 billion in order to build um, our first fusion machine to demonstrate that this reaction can be done in a commercially relevant device, meaning it's affordable to build and can be scaled over time. Um, and so we have lots, we've got lots of investors and he was among the first, which was fantastic um, and has been a strong partner. Um, but we continue to collaborate in a very open way, working with national labs here in the US, but also working with laboratories and universities globally. Um, our machine design uh, was built on proven physics. So as the deputy director general said, there's been lots of research in this area. The tokamak, the magnetic confinement is, is probably there's over 150 machines in the world and that is what ITER is designed off as well. So the proven physics uh, modeling that was done to make the determination to use a tokamak design for ITER, we have leveraged that same uh, science. And so we'll be using the proven physics of the tokamak design, but we're putting in the novel technology of a newer material that's been invented more recently and become commercially available, these high temperature superconductors, which make high powered magnets, which means you can make the machine smaller. Um, so we're in the process and the timeline matters here. Uh, we're in the process of building uh, our demonstration uh, fusion machine, it's called Spark. Uh, it's in Massachusetts, and we started construction about two years ago, and we will be operational with that machine in 2025, and then we'll look to be uh, demonstrating sort of that net gain that the direct, de Deputy Director General talked about of more power out than in uh, soon thereafter. And that puts us on a path of looking at putting a commercial power plant, a fusion power plant, into the grid in the early 2030s. And that has been the timeline we've been operating on. Um, and so from a perspective of what's needed to make that work, the, the science and the technology have to happen. But we also need policies and regulations that uh, give us things such as regulatory certainty. And so I would say the U.S. Uh, and the U.K., in particular the U.K. here on regulatory, has been leading the way in thinking about what is that environment that needs to happen. And they've already put out uh, a green paper indicating how they would want to regulate this. And they've recognized it's very different than vision. And so it'll be regulated by their um, health and safety uh, offices as an environmental office, as opposed to the nuclear office. And the US is going through the same process. We've been participating in this regulatory public consultation period, and we're nearing the end of that. And, and we're looking forward to hearing from uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here. And we're hopeful that it'll be similar to how the UK is treating that. So that creates regular certainty. That matters. That attracts the commercial industry to say this is a place we would want to look to build power plants. And um, and so we are we've already kicked off the site search for our first power plant. Um, if you think about construction timelines, if we're going to build something in the early 2030s, we need to start now. Uh, so we're looking globally for that first site, and we look for things like regulatory certainty or other policies and incentives that fusion can participate in. Um, and the US did some legislation recently, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, which fusion can participate in some of those clean energy incentives. So that helps reduce the capital cost uh, for us. But um, we know that that's, those are things being considered in Europe now. So by no means do we think the US and the UK have created this environment that means uh, that's a foregone conclusion that the, that will be ahead of Europe. It's just we're in the early stages now and it's this is the right time for Europe to be thinking about that regulatory certainty for the commercial sector in the 2030s, as well as any policies that would help fusion on a level playing field with other clean energy. So Andre, we've just heard there about the, the Spark project and how we need regulatory certainty in order to translate that into something that can feed into the power grid by the early 2030s. Andre, how do you think that the EU is doing in terms of providing that regulatory certainty and what opportunities there are there? Um, Jennifer mentioned the US IRA. Obviously at the moment here in Brussels, we are in the middle of crafting the EU's response to the IRA. Uh, what opportunities are there in that project 
to encourage some investment in fusion and provide regulatory certainty. Yeah, definitely. And uh, before I uh, explain, I would also like to, write, like to react. Uh, when I was talking about that uh, we should do more, it was exactly uh, in this regard. I, in the beginning, outlined that you has a proven track in, uh, in fusion uh, and uh, uh, there has been a lot done, will be a lot done. Uh, and it is not definitely uh, DGNR and not definitely uh, Mr. Gariba. Uh, responsible for the fact that today uh, the awareness is lower when we have a reaction of you, you know, of you on uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act in uh, the United States. We do not explicitly uh, mention fusion, and uh, when we prepare tools, uh, communications uh, uh, directly from Brussels, uh, both in all different institutions, we do not speak about uh, fusion as something that will definitely be there and will definitely be part of the solution. So this is the what I wanted to distinguish. And of course, it is linked with uh, the next um, 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 regulatory steps, because if we recognize, we would uh, uh, then faster go for some regulatory changes. So the main aspect, uh, and if you check uh, the EU roadmap for fusion, which uh, was uh, prepared a few years ago, uh, stated one of the biggest gaps. Uh, there is no main uh, legislation. And uh, when I talk to different stakeholders, uh, they confirm it. So we need to create specific, um, just built for fusion legislation that will address its specificity. And um, uh, this will be the first step. Second step, uh, of course, we need to streamline uh, the money uh, through the funds, uh, through, through fin financial instruments to motivate uh, the private sector, because it is obviously clear. And uh, to my knowledge, this is very well working, uh, especially in the US, to attracting uh, the private sector. It is private finance mainly that are uh, boosting up uh, the development of uh, this sector. So we need to address it uh, when the time comes uh, in uh, the EU uh, related tools. So uh, I believe that within within next uh, uh, few years we start uh, to communicate next so-called long-term budget of the uh, European Union and uh, this should uh, more specifically also uh, welcome uh, this uh, this technology, because it has, it, as it has been said uh, uh, by uh, participants of this panel, it's not only about uh, the final state that we will be able to have affordable, clean and safe uh, energy, but it would create a number of, um, um, I would say, high-tech jobs. And there could be clear secondary effect, as for example, in uh, the healthcare system, as it has been explained. Um, Francesca, as any, what would you like to see <clears throat> in terms of the regulatory structure to create that type of certainty that's needed for um, investment? And follow-on question to that, are you concerned that the IRA in the U.S. could give, uh, could put uh, the U.S. kind of in the lead, attract investment infusion over there? Um, what would you like to see as the EU is now crafting its response to the IRA? Thank you for the question. That's <laughs> rather important. Uh, well, yes, uh, we've been looking closely at what the UK and the U US are doing. Of course, UK uh, started earlier, and uh, the, I think they're in the final stages of, uh, of, of drafting a, a law, which will come out in force in July, if I'm not wrong, or at least they expect so. And so uh, that, that was done on a public consultation basis and was very, a very good exercise, I think. So we are looking into that and obviously following what's, what's happening in the US. I don't see a threat there. I see an opportunity, actually, because these are two living examples of uh, how you can tackle a new form of energy in advance without getting to the demonstration of the technology without having... A, um, a landscape, a, a tech, um, regulatory system to, to work with, and we, we know how damaging that could be. So I, I, think, um, I think in other parts of, of the world, uh, we are a global, uh, global company, so we, we look at everywhere, 
uh, and, and the EU can follow the paths, and I would like to see that done on, on a basis of, of best practices and, um, and opportunities, because there's opportunities for, of course, energy, energy production, but also high-tech jobs, as it ha has been mentioned. And I think this is what we, we really welcome seeing. Uh, we are part of the uh, Fusion Industry Association, which is, yes, 80% uh, uh, based in the US, but not only, and also looking to Europe. So I wouldn't see uh, threats or competitions. I would see collaboration there. Um, Susanna, when we talk about regulatory frameworks, oftentimes targets are part of those regulatory frameworks. What would you say is realistic in terms of targets for fusion? Um, as lawmakers look at what could be said, obviously they don't want to set targets too low or too high. What's realistic? I think the, at least the, in my view, the realistic thing is to learn uh, of our ITER experience. I mean, we are building ITER as a fully compliant nuclear reactor with French legislation and regulations. And a large part of our problems come from adapting uh, to these regulations and then see how they can be modified for a fusion uh, device, etc., etc. So this is not just, uh, you know, pie in the sky for us. We are hitting these issues daily. And I think there will be a lot to learn from the ITER experience. So as to realistic targets, uh, I cannot say right now. I, I think uh, uh, lessons learned will be important there. But we've talking. We've been talking a lot so far about climate change, about how this is a kind of no-brainer solution for climate change if it works. What about energy security? Obviously, that is a big concern at the moment, and we know that uh, the EU has been obviously highly dependent on Russia for fossil fuels, but also for nuclear fuel. Uh, and, and you know, we we know the origins of ITER. So, how does this connect to uh, the the challenge of energy security that Europe is so worried about right now? Well, I think that uh, in terms of energy security, uh, fusion is a rather uh, no-brainer, if you like, because the, um, as far as technologies are concerned, they are technologies which are, let me say, known and reproducible, or unknown and not reproducible at the moment. So we will have to see how they, how they uh, develop and adapt. Uh, when it comes to the question of uh, the fuel which has to be used in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a magnetic fusion reactor, it is two isotopes of hydrogen. One is deuterium, which is, uh, let me say, generally available in water and, uh, and uh, easily, um, easily uh, you know, produced, let me say, with, with known techniques. And the second one is tritium. Tritium is a tricky uh, is a tricky thing. Uh, it's difficult to handle because it, uh, uh, you know, is an isotope which has to be handled quite quickly. It has a half life, so it halves its its mass in in twelve years or so. Uh, most of all, uh, you know, at the moment it is produced in uh, certain types of conventional nuclear reactors, for which we have some in, in the EU, but mostly in Canada and in Korea, in, in, in the world. Um, uh, but the, the, the whole bet of, of magnetic fusion is to actually be able to regenerate tritium from the, from the uh, fusion reaction itself. So in terms of, if this is done, and this is part of, uh, if you like, the technological demonstration of it, if this is done, then you will have, uh, you will have a cycle which is basically uh, self-sustained. And therefore, in terms of energy security, this is a, a very advantageous situation. So I would, I, 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 I would say that, uh, that uh, you know, like, renewables are, you know, produced locally and so on, uh, fusion may become a self-sustained uh, form of energy production. Um, Francesca, when any is talking to policymakers, how much is this energy security aspect um, a, a, uh, something that interests them? 
in, in particular when thinking about uh, the, the dependency of for nuclear fuel for fission at the moment, um, this idea that it could be actually fusion could be self-sustaining. Do you think that's a, is that an attractive element for policymakers? Do our policymakers aware enough about that possibility? Well, I'm not sure they're totally aware, actually. But uh, yes, when when we when we have a bit more informed discussions, then that comes into play as a, as an important part um, of of the discussion itself. And these are points that we are also exploring with uh, with CFS, of course, and uh, trying to to. Um, well, to have informed discussions, but I, I guess it's an increasingly important part. And of course, well, uh, my company has been in in the energy sector for a long time and looking at alternatives in, in terms of fossil fuels as well, uh, as you may know from 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 the news from the press recently. But also diversification uh, with renewables and other things. So I, th I think this is coming more and more into the debate, and I think it's important. Let's talk a little bit about costs before I'll, I'll take some of your questions that have come in from the audience. Jennifer, we're talking about big projects here, right? Um, these are expensive projects. W what are the costs for really getting to where we want to go with fusion? And are those costs uh, bearable for the public, especially considering that there is a possibility that this doesn't work out and that there could have been a lot of money spent on it? Yeah, um, well, we have high confidence in, in this working out. <laughs> uh, we, we're working very hard at some of the things that were just discussed on uh, some of the technology aspects uh, for the power plant, but the device that we're building, Spark, now is under construction. Um, but from a cost perspective, it's interesting. Um, we do believe that as fusion gets to scale, we expect it to be one of the cheapest dispatchable um, powers. and there's two aspects of cost, right? There's a capex, the capital cost to build the machines. And I think it's gonna vary. Um, there's lots of different technologies as was pointed out. There's 35, I think some over 30 uh, fusion companies pursuing lots of different technologies. I can speak from our perspective. Um, when we look at what those capital costs consists of, it is uh, a lot of steel and concrete <laughs> to build the building and build the machine. Uh, and so there's some of that upfront capital cost. One of the one of the more expensive capital costs initially for machines such as Spark or Arc is the uh, high temperature superconducting tape that makes these very high powerful magnets. But we have already seen in the very short time that we've been um, purchasing this HTS tape in the market and new suppliers coming on. We just signed a new supplier as of two two months ago in Asia. Um, the, that cost curve is coming down and we anticipate that that will come down as well. So from our perspective, we'll have the sort of receipts from building Spark. We're going to know how much it costs to build the machine uh, and we're going to see those cost curves come down and we're already thinking about building at scale. And so to keep capital costs low, we're thinking of sort of a manufacturable machine that comes off of you know, sort of a production line. So we've actually brought staff on uh, who have worked at, in the automotive industry, the aerospace industry, to think about how do you ramp up production at scale to develop these machines in order to bring those costs down. So things we think about today are going to have huge implications for us in the, in the coming years as those production lines are built and we're able to keep uh, the capital costs down. Then there's the OPEX, uh, the operating costs side of that. Um, and so, as was pointed out, the hydrogen isotopes, um, deuterium is, is available, and we're talking from a tritium perspective of being able to acquire some initial tritium uh, when we start up the machine, and we're talking grams levels of the type of uh, fuels levels that are needed, but then being able to uh, breathe or create more tritium within the device itself. Um, so, and there'll be maintenance costs and operating costs that have to go, but they're, they're not significantly high the way and they're not uh, sort of susceptible to the volatility of say, uh, sort of oil and gas prices that you see today. We think that they'll be more stable. So ultimately it will depend on each machine, but um, there was a study done by McKinsey and I would encourage people to go look at that study. Um, it was uh, particularly looking at Europe, which I think is helpful for this group. Um, and it came out last fall. And they really, they looked at costs compared to others and, and their conclusion was that fusion could be the most cost effective and probably a dominant source of clean energy in Europe in 2050 um, on a decarbonized power grid if we're able to keep those sort of uh, costs, you know, sort of dollar per kilowatt 
uh, costs down for the overnight capital cost of the new build of fusion, which is exactly how we're thinking about it as we build this industry. So we anticipate to be extremely competitive uh, as the industry scales. Okay, let's take some questions <clears throat> from the audience that have come in via Slido. Just a reminder, you can type in your questions on Slido and I'll ask them to the panelists. Uh, first, two related questions are about what we were just discussing um, in terms of energy security. Andre, I'll put this, these two questions to you. Um, so Maud Bauman says, <clears throat> panelists have emphasized the role of international cooperation for fusion. However, isn't there a risk of falling into a new technological or energy dependency? Should fusion adopt a Europe first approach as well? And then Guilherme Cardoso asks uh, very simply, what is the status of Russia's participation in ITER? Okay, so I'm not able to speak about the ITER project and the role of, uh, of Russia. Maybe uh, my colleague from European Commission could advise, advise on this. When it comes to um, the strategic autonomy, uh, we are now talking about open strategic autonomy. And uh, to be very fair, uh, transatlantic cooperation, uh, because we talk about also uh, umbrella of NATO and so on, I, we don't expect uh, in uh, 20, 30, 40 years uh, dramatic change in this. And uh, the way how to, uh, let's say, reduce even residual risk uh, 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 is to invest uh, into uh, fusion in Europe as well and support those projects, because then uh, we will be able to uh, do it uh, alone or with our partners. So the answer is to go forward uh, faster. The same what we are now as a Europe doing with renewables. And uh, this is my main concern. We are fully um, investing in, uh, in renewables only. But if we look uh, around 2050, we will need so much electricity to decarbonize so many sectors that we also would like to have in the EU because of the strategic autonomy. And uh, therefore, we will need this source uh, because with renewables, we will not be able to make it. So the answer is, uh, if you want to be safe, uh, you need to invest into uh, other than non-fossil and renewable energies because they are already covered and uh, invest in EU. Um, Massimo, do you want to take that question about Russia's participation in ITER? Well, um, ITER, as I said, was thought out in 1985, and the situation was a little bit the opposite of what we have, of what we have today. I mean, this was the moment when the Cold War started to end, and uh, the walls were coming down, and so on and so forth. Um, the ITER agreement does not foresee um, uh, throwing out a partner, so uh, this is uh, this is the current uh, this is the current situation. Russia has so far been respecting uh, their commitments, and so we will have to see how this uh, uh, this goes on. There are obviously difficulties, and uh, we will need to thread very carefully. On, on this type of, of collaborations, and we will have to see how the, the situation evolves. It is clearly a sore point uh, in, uh, at the moment, um, but as I said, I mean, uh, if you look at it, uh, if you look at it on the, on the legal side, it is, uh, uh, it is difficult to act. So you will need to have, let me say, a collective uh, political will of the other partners uh, to exclude one, and we will have to see how this moves. Interesting. Um, let's go next to a question uh, from Maud Bauman again. So I'm going to put this to Francesca. Uh, when do panelists expect that fusion will be ready to contribute to producing low carbon energy in the EU? Do they expect competition with existing or future nuclear fission plants? And a related question uh, from Guilherme Cardoso. The EU has a net zero objective for 2050. Will fusion reactors be available on an industrial scale big enough to have any significant contribution to achieving that 2050 goal? Shouldn't we be applying the same amount of EU funds to proven fission technologies? 
uh, and Guillermo was from nuclear Europe. Uh, so Francesca, what's the timeline here for establishing this and would it be ready in time to meet the, to contribute to the 2050 goal? Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, that's, that's the question, isn't it? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, the, the timeline we, we have, uh, as Jennifer mentioned before, is demonstration of the technology by the middle of this decade and having the first uh, power plants uh, connected to the grid at the beginning of 2030. Now, then there'll be a ramp up, of course. So we, figure, we are figuring out that the technology will be ready for commercial use by the mid-2030s. And it will ramp up. And if the conditions continue on with, uh, with, uh, um, with the technology evolving and the supply chain comes in place and everything else and goes at scale, as Jennifer was mentioning, it will make a, a significant contribution to decarbonization to, to 2050 goals. We believe that. In the meantime, for that second question, should fission be given an equal amount of funding given that it's a proven technology? Uh, I think we will we'll need everything in the energy mix. So, yes, I know that, that we, we don't do fission, so I'm not the expert there, but uh, there are new initiatives going ahead and uh, on for the small modular reactors and compact uh, technology. So uh, th there will be some limitations for public acceptance, I imagine, but, I mean, it's technology. It's proven technology to a certain extent, so I don't see why not. Massimo, how would you respond to this point about fission being a proven technology that needs, deserves e equal funding at least? Fission is a much more mature technology than fusion, so it needs uh, uh, intrinsically less financing from the, pub from the public sector than, uh, than fission, which as I said is a technological and scientific demonstration point. So I, would, I could not equate the two in, uh, in the same way. If you look at the way that research money is spent in Europe, um, you will see that uh, lots of the money which is spent on fission goes on research on waste management, on uh, uh, safety issues and so on, but it doesn't go really to the heart of, uh, let me say, the design of, of, uh, of facilities. So I think it, it, it's really a question of different development stages. Um, Jennifer, let me put Maud's question to you as well um, in terms of the timeline here. When will fusion be ready to contribute to producing low carbon energy? I know you mentioned the early 2030s for the Spark project or what will become the ARC system. Um, is the 2030s a realistic goal in general or is that really just for that leading project? Yeah, um, the timeline that we have in place is for the first power plant in the early 2030s. And so, um, as I mentioned, we, we think about scale and we think about the design of the machine so that it can be scaled. And we anticipate shortly thereafter being able to build more machines. And the goal and the objective we have is to have thousands of arcs in the world by the 2050s. And so that's a substantial part of the uh, energy generation that's out there. Um, the ARC is being designed to be around a 400 megawatt facility um, that would produce that amount of electricity. Uh, and so if you think about thousands of those in the world, we start to see a significant contribution to the energy sector. But that is scaling up into the 40, you know, scaling up through the 40s pretty rapidly. Um, so yes, we do believe it will have meaningful impact. It will be a, a big part of that. But um, but. Those first, the first machines from, we're not the only ones who have a timeline of the early 2030s. Uh, there are other companies that are, uh, have made those same uh, sort of commitments. And it was mentioned earlier, um, the US government uh, has actually put out a policy, it's called the Bold Decadal Vision for Fusion Energy. And, uh, and they are trying to partner with the private sector and, uh, and work through what is a milestone-based cost share program to put some of those initial uh, uh, power plants, fusion power plants into the grid in the early 2030s as well. So we're seeing some support from the government here to try to move forward with that timeline as well. Uh, so I, I would say yes, I see a substantial contribution, but it is closer to the 2050s versus the early 2030s. I think you'll start to see some of the first machines come on and, and then there'll be, uh, there'll be sort of more rapid growth as we hit later in the, later in the decade.
Okay, I'm going to put this next audience question to Susanna. Um, this question is from John Russ, and it's about this fission versus fusion question. Uh, John says, fission and fusion are set up against each other. Should this be viewed as short-sighted and a misunderstanding of both technologies and readiness? Um, what do you think about this idea? Is it, are we getting into a trap of setting fission and fusion as antagonistic toward each other? Yeah, I don't think they are antagonists. They are both nuclear fusion, nuclear energy, and uh, we are uh, sort of standing on the shoulders of our fission forebears in, in many ways. So actually, I think uh, fission should be part of the solution uh, also because, uh, well, I, I hope uh, this uh, f fast deployment of uh, fusion reactors can happen. But in the meantime, we know that fusion works. So I, I don't think there is an antagonism there. It's, uh, it's uh, when it works, fusion will be a cleaner nuclear energy because of the lack of uh, long lived uh, residues, etc. But uh, it's basically, uh, you know, if you go to the the tonnage of fuel you need for the other uh, sources of energy, uh, where you, you're speaking of uh, thousands of tons to uh, hundreds of kilos in the case of fission and a few grams in the case of fusion. But still, uh, it's, quite, it's quite there. It works. And I think in this moment, the, the public is getting more open to the idea of fission than the politicians, probably. Yeah, well, we have a related question on that uh, idea of public acceptance. Let me put this one to Andre. Um, this is from Emilia Valboom from 3M, which is part of the US-based TerraPower project. Um, the question is, how do you believe we can ensure public acceptance of fusion energy in Europe? Um, any company investing in fusion would be interested in whether citizens are ready once technology is developed at commercial scale. So how, how do we address this question of public acceptance, Andre? In terms of public acceptance, uh, the fusion is on much uh, better position than the fusion. Uh, I'm persuaded that uh, there is no white uh, resistance against the fusion. Uh, fusion is either not known, and those who know it, uh, at least on the public level, not in the detail, they, they think it's something that it's not too early to come. Uh, it will take maybe a few decades, but they are not against. Yeah? So firstly, what we need to do is to inform about the, uh, the development, about the progresses, and that we are not talking uh, about something that will be here in 40 years, but maybe in 10, 15, 20 years on commercial level. And uh, uh, then we are fine because there is no resistance, for example, like in uh, the, the fission, which is a big drawback. It's ideology driven. Uh, however, it is in the European Union as such. Uh, there are some member states that from historical reasons simply oppose, oppose uh, fission. But I don't think this is uh, related to fusion. Fusion is uh, much better starting uh, conditions and uh, um, it's, it could be part of uh, the strategy to develop fusion. And I say it as uh, someone who uh, is definitely not against uh, fusion as such, because uh, we will need all energy sources that uh, are low carbon or uh, zero carbon. Um, Francesca, nuclear fission obviously has a complicated history in Italy, uh, which made it a very big choice a while ago as a country. Um, how do you think the receptiveness is in Italy in particular to fusion? Um, we had a couple of surveys last year, one at the beginning of the year and one towards the end. And uh, it, it, was, um, it was interesting because uh, the first one revealed that no one really knew what it was. Um, and after, after explanations, they, they were quite enthusiastic. In the second round, m a lot more people knew about it, and they were, the, the general acceptance was, was quite high. So we're confident. Of course, then you have to start building things, and <laughs> that may change things, but we keep an eye on that. 
Um, Massimo, I've got two questions here for you, which I think I could characterize as uh, uh, skepticism or gripes about the regulatory structure. So um, this first question is from Luis Guimare. Uh, as a former fusion researcher, there are always an abysmal disconnect between EU policy and the work plans of national labs. How is the EU addressing the lack of people power and lack of lab guidance um, since labs are premium recruiters. And then another question from an anonymous questioner. What is the European strategy for developing fusion as a source of electricity? There are many different initiatives at the moment, like Eurofusion, ETER, the private sector, etc. but the overall strategy is not clear. Shall we start with the second one? Sure. Um, I think that there is a, and I will try and chip in the first one. I think that there is a very um, integrated view, in fact, of what needs to happen. And um, what needs to happen is that we have a sort of uh, test bed machine, which is ITER, uh, where there is a convergence of interest from all the European laboratories and all the workforce that there is in, in Europe for fusion. And this is now you know, whether you call it Eurofusion as the consortium that brings together all the laboratories or something else, I mean, uh, this, I think, is the, is, is the main avenue of, of bringing this together. Um, second, I mean, when you want to move, uh, it is clear that the picture is becoming, uh, is becoming how can I say, um, more fuzzy. Uh, you heard the, the colleagues from the private sector that talk about timetables, which are much more aggressive than the timetables that, uh, that we have in, uh, in ITER, for example, where we should get full performance uh, at the moment in 2035. So they are talking about commercial deployment in, uh, in, uh, in 2035. Uh, it's, it's 10 years difference huh, of, of what, uh, what we are talking about. So this is the, uh, at least, this is, uh, this is potentially the, uh, what I call the benefit of the ecosystem and the possibility of having disruptive technology from, from, from the private sector. So I think that the moment has come uh, exactly because we are, uh, you know, let me say, we are stepping out from the traditional way in which the path to fusion was viewed which was a path of uh, technological and scientific demonstration, then a demonstrating reactor, and then mass production. I think that the, what has happened is that through the entering into the uh, picture of the, of the private sector, probably this is going to be disrupted and will work with different dynamics. So in the commission, we are reflecting at the moment on uh, whether the time uh, has come to have a holistic look at uh, the whole picture and see how we see in Europe a uh, further development. We are at the very early stage of, of having a reflection, but it is possibly, as I said, a, go a good moment to start thinking whether this is, uh, this is the time to, uh, to do that and prepare for the next financial period and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is a little bit, so you need, you need all these forces, that's what I'm trying to say, yeah? Uh, you, need, you need the science and the laboratories in Europe. You need the industrial elements. I just wanted to, 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 to mention a little number. Um, in uh, Fusion for Energy, which is our, our joint undertaking for ITER that you know, gives, the, gives the, the components to ITER and so on, has spent so far 5.1 billion on 565 companies 1,700 subcontractors and 73 research organizations. So this is, this is just to give you the scale of the effort that is needed in order to bring all these together. So you cannot imagine to have something which is piecemeal or, or, or distributed. And fundamental, it's the regulatory framework. And this is something on which we have been, on which we have been working uh, quite consistently, there are different approaches. There is, you know, what is being done at present, which is licensing ITER under, let me say, the conventional nuclear legislation in France. 
But the question is, are there different approaches? You know, the debate in the US is not closed at all. It's, there is a deadline of 2027 for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the US to decide whether uh, f uh, fusion is to be regulated, let me say, like fission, or is to be regulated like um, accelerators that are used in other branches of, of fundamental science. And this, of course, will be a great distinction and will dictate you know, how much cheaper or more expensive things will be effectively once, uh, once, uh, once they are done. So I think that entering into this debate uh, at the moment is very important. We shouldn't run ahead of ourselves because we would have to have, if we want to give regulatory certainty, we need to have a set of rules which then cannot be changed. But we are at the prototype phase. So it's very difficult to foresee how uh, you can make rules which are generic enough and at the same time um, detailed enough to allow the development of different types of technologies because otherwise we are constraining the path to fusion to being a specific path and a specific technology which I'm not so sure is what we want to do at this stage. When you say the Commission is thinking about some kind of umbrella framework, would that take the form of a communication, a strategy, a directive? At the moment we are thinking. It could be anything. At okay. the moment we are thinking. We are not, uh, we are not uh, uh, even saying that we are doing one, the other, and so on. We are reflecting internally, as I said, whether this is the right time to uh, put the elements together. Uh, we have one very important piece of the puzzle, which is the fact that as many people know, uh, ITER is going to go through a process of rebaselining, so it will have a new schedule, it will probably need to have a revised budget and so on. So we are working on that, and in that framework we need to see how all the pieces of the equation are going to fit together. And as I said, the great novelty at the moment is the private sector, and does it fit? Does it not fit? How do we make sure that in Europe it develops as fast as in the US? So this is, this, these are the questions. The, the way that the Commission will give an answer, I don't know. I, I cannot fully see the future. Um, we have two technical questions that have come in, which I think would be for Jennifer. It's the best place to answer them. They're both from John Ross. Um, how will a reactor extract the heat to power the steam generator? What will the footprint of the reactors be compared to a gas plant? Uh, and then ITER is very large and complex, including the extreme difficulty of components machining. Uh, so two questions there. How the reactor extracts the heat to, to power the steam generator and the footprint of the reactors compared to a gas plant? Yeah, uh, thanks. Good questions. So uh, I can speak to our design specifically. And the idea for the extraction of heat is uh, we will have a vacuum vessel that sits inside our fusion device and the fusion reaction will occur there. The next layer will be a layer of liquid molten salt. It's called a blanket. <laughs> uh, and this is the, the area where uh, the, the tritium breeding I was discussing would happen, but also this is where the heat is captured. And so we, would, we have to design a system in which uh, we can extract the heat from that molten salt and we take that heat and then we treat it just like you would in a combined cycle gas plant or something. You, you take the heat to turn turbines and you put the electricity into the grid that way. Um, so the fusion device sits in the center of it. The balance of plant that sits around it will look very much like today's natural gas plant um, where it's taking heat and creating electricity. So, um, so there's technology and R&D work that is happening. Uh, we have down-selected to the materials that we would like to use for this blanket, but there is still ongoing R&D to help us understand the efficiency of that blanket and how it will work within the device. Uh, and we're partnering with uh, universities and national labs uh, globally to do that work. Um, so that's the sort of technology in a simple way, uh, not being uh, a physicist or an engineer myself. <laughs> that's how I explain it. Um, and then the, I think the second piece was the footprint. So yes, um, the fusion device arc that we are designing itself will 
uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of an analogy, probably it would fit in a tennis court, right? That would, that would be kind of the size of the device. But what you need to understand is there are ancillary buildings that need to be there for uh, cooling of the magnets. So we have to have some cooling technology. You have to have radio frequency technology that comes in to power the magnets. And, um, and so there's footprint, as you would say, would be similar to a natural gas plant probably at the end of the day. But the actual fusion device itself uh, is probably more akin to it would fit in a tennis court type of uh, type of if you had to visualize it. Um, and the components, I, I forget the last part of the question. I apologize, Dave. Do you want to repeat what that was? Uh, it was a, the well, the ETA is very large and complex, including the extreme difficulty of components maintaining. So uh, is it no components machining? It's on components machining. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. No, at the end of the day, there are materials that have to be used in a fusion device that can withstand the extreme heat conditions and the neutrons. And so, yes, uh, there are material science that is being worked on across all of the fusion spectrum. Eater is doing a lot of that work at the forefront of it, actually. And uh, and so we're seeing supply chains develop for companies and uh, and industries that are interested in thinking about how they can supply to the fusion sector. And I think the deputy director general went through the number of suppliers that Eater has, uh, has engaged. Those are suppliers that are the ecosystem we're talking about. There needs to be a global supply chain. There need to be a number of companies that are able to supply the materials that can fit into, that can be withstand the conditions of the fusion machine. Uh, and that work is ongoing and we're seeing great success there, uh, but there's more work to be done and then that will have to scale. Uh, but, uh, but as was mentioned, some of that early work that Eater has been doing with, their, with building that supply chain has been very helpful to the commercial sector. Well, we're just about out of time, but before we go, I want to get from our three non-lawmakers a quick elevator pitch to our two lawmakers here on the panel. What is the number one thing you need in terms of policy and regulation uh, in order to make the, the fusion dreams come true? Um, 30 seconds, each of you. Francesca, what is the most important thing you need from policymakers? Um, I would say continuity and uh, and best practices, uh, so uh, reliable, uh, reliable, uh, reliable framework. Uh, Susanna, what would you say? Mm. Well, I I think I'm more in the lawmaker side because it's <laughs> the formal fusion program. So we would say budget <laughs> to continue, but budget, yeah. there again. <laughs> And finally, Jennifer, what would you say is the most important thing you need from policymakers? Yeah, I, I think twofold. I, I, it echoes a lot of what people have said. It is uh, regulatory certainty so that if we decide we want to build a power plant somewhere, we understand the cost implications of the regulations. Um, there's other policies that would uh, incentivize clean energy and for fusion to be participating in that. So I think of things like green taxonomy. And, uh, and having fusion be eligible and in, in, in identified in the green taxonomies there in Europe. Um, and, uh, and then continued partnerships where we're able to do those partnerships with the national labs and universities around the world and, and at, this, at the country level that we're able to do those agreements and, and continue to build the whole entire ecosystem. Great. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for some great insights. I think we've heard a lot of exciting potential here uh, for fusion technology. And I think very importantly, we've heard that the commission is thinking seriously about this and also thinking about what possible new framework or umbrella framework could be helpful here in making all of this become a reality. Uh, so thank you so much to the panelists here in the room and uh, online. And thank you to all of you joining us at home or in the room. If you're here in the room, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, reception outside where you can do some networking and keep talking about exciting fusion issues. Uh, if you're watching at home, I wish you an excellent rest of your afternoon. And we'll see you for the next Your Active Debate.